All right, technical difficulties. Stay yes. with us. Is this one working? All right. Yeah, we're uh, on the map. Are we on? All right, we're in business. We're, uh, we're, congratulations we're on again the map. on yeah. the film. Yeah, thank you so much, and 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 I want to say thank you guys really for uh, San Francisco Jewish Film Festival. What I mean, what an incredible place to be. I mean, look at this place. <laughs> And uh, I want to really, really thank you guys because you really have no idea what this movie and how it will be, and you still came, so I really appreciate it. Uh, because it is our world premiere and it is our opening, so uh, this film, you know, is, it, it really tells a story from my childhood and it combines three things I really love, which is filmmaking, sport, and Israel. And that's how I met John Weibach. <laughs> Our great producer, who loves the same things, you know, and we share the love for, uh, for this story. So I'll say quick thanks and then we'll go for Q&A. And, and, uh, and so again, thanks uh, Jay, Lexi, Josh, all the guys, the wonderful people that really uh, accepted us so wonderfully here, the, here at the uh, San Francisco Jewish Film Festival. And I want to thank Nancy Spielberg, Roberta Grossman, the creators of Above and Beyond that helped me put this also together. Uh, Ori Eisen, Marit Eisen, that were with us yesterday, the opening night in Palo Alto, which was incredible. Um, I wanted to say that there was a standing ovation and we haven't uh, take, taken any pictures of it, so if you want to, guys want to do it again, <laughs> we'll take a picture of it. Just another way to, yeah, to get. Uh, uh, thank you so much for many people that came from so many places uh, to see this film and I want to acknowledge them. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Jen Botride, uh, who is uh, Jennifer Botride, who is the wife of uh, uh, Jim Botride, and uh, Barry Axler came from Chicago, and David Bryant, who helped us so much in the movie, is here. And, um, and I want to tell you guys that if you like the film, we are planning to do theatrical release uh, towards the end of the year. And it will be really totally up to you. I know it's a lot to, to put on your shoulders, but it's totally up to you to have the word of mouth. So please go on our website if you liked it and go on Facebook or we're on the map on Facebook and like us, share what, if, if you like it, of course, share it with your friends. If you didn't like it, just keep it to yourself. <laughs> and and um, um, I've been doing this for uh, many years. I mean, it's really one of my most you know, important stories. Somebody asked me how long I've been working on this film, so I said three years, but really actually 40 years, because that's when it happened. That's when I remember my dad carrying me like a seven-year-old, and I'm very privileged to have watched the movie with my seven-year-old, so all those noise and the problems that we caused, it, it was us, so we really <laughs> apologize. And, and uh, I've been, uh, Traveling with my films, 39 Pounds of Love, which uh, won the Israeli Academy Award. And thank you, and was here also in the festival. Also, Dolphin Boy, Is That You? All those films are outside to sell. I mean, if you buy those films, I think you may enjoy them if you like this one. And you're also supporting our effort <laughs> to continue doing these kind of independent films and, uh, and uh, doing what we do. And another last thing is that we also have a ball to sell. Last night, we did a silent auction. We got to $500. And if somebody want to bid it, we have signature uh, sign. Uh, 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 Tal Brody have signed this ball. And Nancy Spielberg and myself. So um, all the money will go towards trying to get theatrical release of this movie. And if somebody really want to sponsor us, we're, we'll, <laughs> we're also open for that. So uh, that's it to your questions. And uh, unless, John, what, you want to say something before the questions? No, just uh, bravo to Danny. Uh, thank you for help letting me be a part of this. And thank you for, for coming out. All right. Uh, before we uh, kick it to, to you guys, I just had a few questions to, to start off. Um, so all the great sports stories that we know about in this country, how come we hadn't heard of this one before? I'll, I'll tell you that. I mean, partially we're pretty much obsessed with American sports. I mean, um, it, and when Americans tend to think of international sports stories, we tend to think of the Olympics. Um, and I've had the chance to work on a number of stories in, in not just the sports, but in specifically in the basketball space. And I think generally we think of the 1972 Munich games, we think of 1988, 92, the Dream Team. And I think that, 
you know, for many people, until very recently, international basketball was a mystery. And it was, this was not something that was well publicized at the time uh, outside of the United States or even within Europe. And so I think, you know, that's part of the, um, the appeal of the story for me. I, I you know, I, I grew up a massive basketball fan from Los Angeles, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, my dad's two sisters made Aliyah, and, and I had uh, friends from Israel who I went to school with who were big Maccabi Tel Aviv fans. So I had an awareness of this story, and uh, I had done a film uh, in 2012 that went to the Sundance Film Festival about the Lithuanian Olympic basketball team. It featured a guy named Sherudis Marshallonis, some of the Warrior fans might know him. Um, and th those guys were stars of the Soviet sports machine. Um, but they were Lithuanian, and nobody knew that. And then they went to the 92 Olympics, representing Lithuania, sponsored by the Grateful Dead, um, and beat their longtime political oppressors, Russia. So I knew a little thing about making the Russian basketball team look like bad guys. Um, and so I was immediately attracted to this. And I think that's, that's the genius of the story, and that's why I think it needs to be shown to more people, because it isn't well known. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what are some of the challenges, you know, when you're trying to find archival material? You know, does a lot of it exist? And um, maybe you can talk a little bit about that process. This was a different film that I've made uh, in terms of, in, if in 39 Pounds of Love, I just followed some, you know, a story for a few years. Same for Dolphin Boy. Or on my fiction film, you know, you need to really dig into writing the right script to make a good story. Here... I believe you, what made this movie come to life was the fact that we have found footage that has never been seen. And I said, you know, documentary is like going fishing. So if you're going to shoot, you're going, like, you're going uh, with Dolphin Boy, you, you, you find really big fish, you know, in, in the ocean. But literally here, we were digging in the archive world. And as soon as we found uh, footage that nobody, the, the players didn't know it existed, and we knew, we knew that this story, and if people from Israel, they, they know this story and they already saw it in black and white, but everything you saw in colors were things that we have found from private people that just came with the eight millimeters and, and found it and just happened to give it to us. I'll give you one example. We have found that uh, the Luxembourg TV shot behind the scene of the game between Maccabi and Cheska Moskva, and they, not like us, they have saved the rushes, nah. and we could use it. And that's why, again, you could see some of those things in colors. And uh, in the political world, also, you know, all the story of Rabin, all the story of Moshe Dayan and, and Entebbe, I mean, this is part of who we are. And I think the fact that we could bring all this archive to life made the movie more than just a talking head. Sure. And what was it like for, for Tal Brody and the other players to actually see this footage again if, after so many years? Um, and have they seen the finished film? Uh, it's amazing, by the way, because we are planning to tour also with this film with Tal Brody. And I mean, give a hand to Tal Brody, because this is really, I mean... Uh, imagine the guy giving up on the NBA and coming just because... just. Until today, by the way, Tal Brody wants to put Israel on the map. That's, that's his thing. And when he saw it, in some ways, he felt like he closed the circle because we could not believe that there was no movie about it. For us, Tal Brody saying on the map is like, for you guys, one small step from men, one giant leap from mankind, Neil Armstrong. So Tal Brody is a Neil Armstrong for us. For us, to beat the Russians is like going to the moon. Uh, seriously, I mean, yeah, we... we, we <laughs> We had few, back then it wasn't in the shekels, we have liras. We couldn't go to the moon, but for us, the fact that we beat the Russians, and this is, these are the guys that don't want to play against us, especially now, especially now that you can see still people boycotting Israel. You know, and no matter what, what position you have in politics, you know, everybody agrees that you cannot boycott Israel. And like the movie shows, if you will do that, you're probably going to lose. And... All right, let's, um, let's hear from you. Um, raise your hand. We have um, a mic going around, so um, it's hard to see, but uh, <laughs> let's see. Let's... Yes, 
I'll, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you, Director. Okay, it looks like we yeah. have a question in the middle here. Middle section. Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask about the interview with Bill Walton. So first, uh, how did you know that he, you know, is so familiar with the story, but also he's, he's a great interview. Yeah. He's so dramatic, like there was one moment where he almost burst crying. And I was just wondering if uh, you guys prompted him a little bit. It's like he never told the story before. Uh, did you do anything to get that kind of reaction from him or was that just natural? Some combination of both. I, I, I've had the opportunity to interview Bill, I think, four times for films. Um, and uh, he, is, he is that. I mean, he really is one of the world's just most interesting and fantastic characters. I had a connection to him um, through having worked with him before, and he had this connection with Tall, uh, having played with him. And, and I was not aware, I don't think either of us were aware of how deep and how meaningful it was. They had played together on this US national team. It was a touring team. It wasn't like now where you have a you know, group of pros playing every four years in the Olympics. The Olympic team and the national team would kind of wax and wane during cycles. And Bill Walton was the best high school player in America playing on what was essentially a military all-star team. And Tall was his protector against a coach he hated. And they had this very special, unique connection that was totally authentic. Um, regarding whether he was prompted, we had sent him, uh, I'd say, a dossier of about 20 pages with research material that I'd put together, that Danny had put together, like the context of European basketball in the tournament. And Bill is, if nothing else, an incredible student of history. And he takes it seriously when he wants to be interviewed. And so all of that emotion and enthusiasm is Bill. That's authentic. And with a little prompting about some of the facts, I think all of that, again, we didn't need, he just let Bill go. Um, and, and he does it, but it came from a place of real authenticity and this personal connection to Tall. And I think we were both blown away. We went to interview him at his house in San Diego, which hasn't changed since 1977. And he was really choked up. At the time when we interviewed him, his mother was ill. And I think that sort of informed his emotion when he got all choked up, as you saw when he was talking about Tall's dad. So if that helps answer the question. All right, On your left, question. towards the back. Uh, thank you. It was a wonderful movie. You did a, a fantastic job of interweaving a really compelling sports story and putting it in its historical and social context. It's great. Um, I'm wondering if you could uh, tell us a little bit about you know whatever became of the players on the team. Did they you know, did they stay with the team? What they did after their careers in basketball? Mm -hmm. So you what the question was about um, how the player doing now. So you need to understand the context of that time. This player really, basketball was not their number one profession. It's not like today, people make so much money. Uh, they had a day job. So they continued their day job and really succeeded. And I can say, you know, some of the guys are one of the top business people. Some are a professor in, in, in Houston University. Some are uh, nurses, some are lawyers. I mean, Lou Silver is a lawyer. Uh, Bob Griffin is a professor. You could see the way even he talks is, is kind of like a professor. Tal Brody is an ambassador for goodwill for Israel, even today. So he's still, as I said, you know, putting Israel on the map. U unique group of people. I mean, it's not an accident that the United States national team, I think, lost to these seven players from Russia, and these guys just beat them. You know, it's, it's just unique players. And Ossie Perry still lives in Israel until today. Yeah, converted as you could see in the movie. Halfway back in the middle section. Again, thank you for the movie. Um, Bill Walton is well known around here because he broadcasts um, Pac-12 basketball games and his son, of course, was the assistant coach, associate head coach for the Golden State Warriors this year and has now gone to the Lakers. But my question has to do with when can I tell my relatives in Israel, this will be on Israeli television. Okay, so first, uh, regarding Golden State uh, and the Warriors, I want to say that we're heartbroken. And Thank we're you. still recovering. We're still recovering. And I think we're there, there, there's probably going to be a movie <laughs> waiting for, for, their next, for the next uh, big victory. And a good job on recruiting, you know, the great players. 
And regarding Israel, I have done a first uh, Israeli version for this film. So in Israel, it's been known. You need to understand, it's, in Israel, it's been known. I've done uh, the film, it, it's called 7778, which is about, also about the year 77. And uh, this story, what you've seen here, was first time ever uh, the American version with Bill Walton, uh, David Stern, Digger Phelps, and all the American point of view. So that's the difference between the screening. So you can be in touch with me and I'll tell the guys in Israel when, where, where they can uh, catch the movie. And of course you can be in touch with me and I'll tell you where you can catch it here in the United States. On your left, towards the back again. Since Israel, I don't believe, is technically in Europe, how does it qualify for the, to play in the European Championship? So uh, you know the story of uh, Israel playing in, in uh, the Israel played in Asia, and obviously you know the ge geographics. There are not many teams that they can play with. I mean, they used to play even against Iran, even against Russia in soccer in the Asian world. But as soon as you know it was impossible, they joined um, the European European League. Until today, by the way, two years ago, Maccabi won again the European Championship. Since then, they won five more times. They became one of the greatest team outside of the NBA in the world. And um, uh, like uh, Sasha Gomelsky said, you know, he asked the same question. How come a team from Asia with players from America are playing in Europe? So that's a good question. Once again on your left. Since Rabin was such a huge basketball fan, how could he not know that the championship was going on the night he decided to make his resignation? Yeah, obviously he knew, but you need to understand that when a prime minister needs to resign, there were probably two, three, four more, th more important things than this specific basketball game. But uh, I, I, I want to tell you, it, it was amazing, and I don't think, you know, that probably shows one of the most naive things about this era, you know, about 1977. More than that, imagine today a prime minister resigns over maybe $20,000 bank account in the United States, which was very normal that if you live in the United States and you're an ambassador, you'll have an American bank account. Imagine a prime minister even resigning about it. Right down in the front row. Hi, I'm David Lamble with the Bay Area Reporter, San Francisco's gay paper, and I've been covering the Jewish Film Festival for a number of years. I think I talked to you, Danny, about 39 Pounds of Love. I wish you could remind us of what that film is about and, uh, and who, uh, from the, how, the, how the people in that film progressed. Yeah, okay, so 39 Pounds of Love is my first uh, international film. I mean, I, I, I've started my world you know, in sport, really. I, I'm a filmmaker because I love sport. But then I met Ami, 39 Pounds of Love, is a guy that is a kid that was uh, not supposed to pass the age of six, and he was 34 years old and just moved one finger because of a rare form of muscular dystrophy, moved one finger, and that's how he created amazing animations. And we did a cross country in the United States to look for the doctor that thought he's not gonna pass the age of six. And uh, the film won the Israeli Academy Award, was shortlisted here for the Oscars was on HBO. A um, few years after the movie, Ami uh, unfortunately passed away, but all his family are very dear to me. And the nice thing about making films, you know, a nice thing about making On The Map and other films is that, you know, they stay after we're passing, you know. They're, they stay there forever. I think that's what drives me to make a movie. So, 39 Pounds of Love is here. I mean, we have, in this exit, on this exit, my DVDs, and anyone wants to check it out and buy it, they're welcome to do so, and I think you know that's what's nice because we felt also with On the Map, and I felt it with 39 Pounds of Love, and maybe with every movie that it stays, and and, and that's what carries us. I mean, nobody you know probably in our time in the documentary world say, oh my gosh, you know how can I really break it and and, and buy a few buildings, you know, and oh maybe I'll do a documentary. That's how I'll do it. It doesn't come from there. It really comes from the love to the story and the fact that. This will stay and, and people will be able always to watch it and understand how with the spirit, you know, a country put, you know, was put in, on the map just because of, you know, a basketball game. Right here in the middle. 
Thank, thank you for the film. I wonder if you could say a little more about Alcee Perry, um, because I wonder, was he the first African-American player? Because I know over the years, there have been regularly African-Americans who've gone to Israel, and some of them have had, I think, um, thought of as uh, questionable conversions to Judaism in order to play. So I'd love to hear more about Alcee Perry. So Alcee Perry is the first questionable converter. Ball. However, I will tell you this, two things about Olsi Perry. First, he's one of the most amazing characters I know. He is my next film. He is my next movie. I shot just a movie about him. I'm writing a script narrative about his amazing life story. Uh, he took again the, the European Championship. He became the poster boy of Israel, uh, dating the top number one model, Tami ben Ami. And then he uh, fell into drugs and... Uh, uh, was in jail for nine years in North Carolina, and then came to Israel. Until today, he's fine, he's uh, sober, clean, he's, he's teaching uh, young kids basketball, he's coaching the youth of Maccabi, and he lives in Israel. So in Othi Perry case, that became, by the way, Elisha Ben Avraham, uh, we cannot question his converted ball. I mean, he's, he's definitely a Jew more than many Jews that I know. You know? So unfortunately, that's all the time we have, but let's thank Danny and John again for the great film. And please recommend it to your friends. Yeah, thank you, Josh. <laughs>